brother. What's going on, Papa? Everything good? All is well, thank God. How you doing, man? Uh, wonderful, my brother. First, first things first, Happy New Year to you. Right. And Happy New Year and Merry Christmas to those who celebrate it, to everybody that's, that's joining us. Uh, much love to everybody. Thank you. Thank right. you so much for having me. Well, you already know, man, you are a legendary, you are a staple, you are Miami hip hop to the bone, you are a renaissance man, and I feel like we just got to jump in because you, you, Cuba, Miami, what's the connection? How how did that go down? Well, the, the connection is real simple. I was born in Havana, Cuba, 1971, and uh, because of the regime and everything that was going on over there, um, we had to leave. Uh, we had... Uh, chances uh, early early in the game, actually before I was born, uh, through my father uh, being recruited by the Brooklyn Dodgers. But you know he, you know he he was a baseball player and a boxer. But unfortunately, he got into the whole you know the political uh, thing and um, started fighting the government. Went to jail for seventeen and a half years of his life. And uh, when he came out, uh, we were dead set on uh, on leaving and. Um, 1980 comes and uh, the Mario boat lift and uh, we jumped in it. <laughs> we jumped in. Uh, I, I believe it was in May, sometime in May. I can't remember the exact date. Uh, Kane got on a boat. To uh, it was a, a long trip. I I, I want to say it was more than 24 hours uh, in the sea. Uh, got here to um, to Key West for uh, um, uh, Key West, Florida. Okay. We we were processed and then we were, we were flown to uh, Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, where we spent um, a couple of weeks, maybe even a month. Our family didn't even know that we was here. Um, and then my cousin, who many of you guys know as Dash, his mom, my auntie, and my, my his grandma, my great auntie, they they claimed us and they brought us to good old Miami. Word. So and so, what neighborhood did you land in when you when you you know once you finally got to Miami? What neighborhood did you get into? When we first got to Miami, I was living with my cousin for a while uh, off of Flagler Street and Forty Eighth Avenue, close to uh, my my soon to be brothers, Chaos and Orco and all those uh, Fifty Sixth Street boys and and Zeke and all of them. But that was a, a, a later in the story. And, and so who was up at that time before you started getting into writing? Who was up in, your, in that neighborhood? Well, uh, when it comes down to writing, um, as far as Miami, there was no real uh, writers per se as far as like uh, graffiti as we know it. There was uh, a lot of gang graffiti. Mm -hmm. there, was, uh, there was a dude that I got a feeling that TMS mentioned it in your, in your um, interview last week. There was a dude named Laz, and that's the first dude that I knew that was all city without us even knowing what hip hop was. You know what I'm saying? Like that dude was all over Miami. Um, now, when I came to realize what graffiti was, was Dash had moved back to New York City around, I, I want to say around uh, 82, around 82 that, that time. So every time that we had a school break, um, in my family, uh, we used to fly out to New York City and stay right there with the family for a while. So my cousin had already, you know, he he's a funny dude, you know what I'm saying? He was already getting into, like, tagging and stuff like that, little chicken scratch stuff. So he kind of, like, introduced me to tagging. But um, see, seeing the subway trains... Um, that's what really got me into it, and that was, and and I really loved seeing the art on the trains because I was already an artist since I was a little kid. I, you know, if you hear it from my from my grandparents, may the rest in peace. Uh, I've been drawing ever since I was a little kid, ever since I was like four or five years old. So when I saw the art on the trains, that captivated me and made me, you know, want to do that. So coming back to Miami. I was already trying to develop my own little thing when it came down to graffiti. Before I used to do portraits, I used to draw like Bruce Lee and samurais and horses and lions and stuff like that. But then I started seeing that New York graffiti and it inspired me. And, you know, it, specifically around 82, which was, you know, I, I always tell everybody, you know, Planet Rock 
is my father. You know what I'm saying? My father and my mom. When I heard the song Planet Rock, it made me who I am to this very day. And, you know, hence, you know, I started asking my cousin for pictures and stuff like that. He would send me some pictures from New York, you know, like stuff like by by Rise, by by Polk, uh, Raz, all these legends from New York, you know what I'm saying? Specifically on the one line, um, you know, and, and all those dudes were huge inspirations to me. Those, Webb, all those guys. And, uh, you know, hence I started writing a little bit. But, you know, again, when it comes down to Miami, as far back, I, I, I could go back as far as like 82 and 80 something. Everything was like gang stuff. The Leopards, Omega. The Bayfront Boys, you know what I'm saying? I remember when when the Bayfront Boys, uh, you know, vandalized my my um, my elementary school, and uh, <laughs> they put uh, after after leopards. You know what I'm saying? Like that. That's the stuff that I remember. Well, that, that jacket that's... that you see right there, yep. that and, and a little bit later in the story, that that ja that's one of the jackets that became very very important in my life right there. That's by Cool C sixty seven, a huge, huge, huge. Actually, I, I call Cool C my my Obi Wan. You know what I'm saying? Cool C inspired me as far as like B boy characters is concerned. Specifically, he was my original original first inspiration, and then later on, uh, uh, Devious Dose from TC Five and Rocksteady Crew. And I mean, yo, so th this piece, this jacket right here actually is hanging in the Museum of Graffiti. That's how yes. legendary it is, you know what I'm saying? And I know you, you mentioned this piece right here, you said was real, uh, you told me off camera, this is a real influential piece. Why was this piece so important to yeah. you? Well, that that's a cool C piece also. Um, uh, I believe that that was like uh, on Citrus Grove Elementary. I didn't get to see that piece like that though. I, I saw it when it was getting buffed, so I didn't really see the, the complete work. But I did see Kusi's two incredible jackets, which was the slice jacket that I believe the, uh, the picture's there too. That one right there, that jacket right there, and uh, and the other one, the Richie jacket that's hanging on the museum. I saw both jackets at the same time in the front of my school. Um, one of them was Boy, Boy Tony, and the one I believe that Kusi had it on. And uh, man, I had already began writing by that time, and I. You know, I thought that I was fresh. That's one of my old characters right there. Um, but when I saw those two jackets, I knew right then and then that I had a long way to go. I was a big, big time toy. And uh, it was C who set me on that path. Word. Um, and th this is another legendary moment in Miami graffiti history. For those of us that don't know, can you school us? What What is this and what was going down? That's Bonnie's crib. That's the pool. That's the famous pool. Um, a bunch of writers got called um, and and to paint this lady's uh, pool. I don't remember the exact connection, who made the uh, original connection, but uh, Bonnie was a cool-ass white lady, and she was down with, uh, with, with a lot of writers. My man, Seam. She was down with my cousin. I know she was down with some of the, uh, my, my brothers from, from DSC. And... Uh, I, I want to say this, this was either 88. Yeah, this had to have been 87, 88. I don't really recall the, the, the exact year, but it had to be either 87 or 88. At that time, I had actually quit dancing by that time. Uh, I mean, not dancing, uh, writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I got lured back by my cousin, who is a very important part of my history because he actually brought me back to writing many, many times when I had quit. And this is one of those times um, I did a, a, a magic piece in the pool with, um, with my man Duo, with Charlie, who, who's my brother since, um, since junior high. That's my cousin and I and his DS piece in the bake house. Um, <laughs> funny stories with that, with that piece, but we, we won't get into beef no, stories. No, no, no. <laughs> so, yeah. Yo, for those of you just joining us, it is the Almighty Chill Ski, Miami legendary, you know, legendary pioneer, all the elements, true Renaissance man, true practitioner. All of you that have supported by purchasing a badge, we really appreciate the love, man. And we we just gonna keep in this uh, this Miami hip hop history, man. So what are we looking at right here, Chill Ski? Oh, that's a uh, two funky fresh piece in one of my black books. That's uh. I want to say that's 87. That's a character of my cousin Dash and, and me. And it says too funky fresh. And um, 
Yeah, <laughs> one of those old black book pieces that thankfully survived because of my cousin. My cousin, he's a, you know, those that know Dash, they, they, you know, he he is something else. He's a trickster, and uh, he practically stole most of my black books. But thankfully, because of him, he preserved them. You know, if it would have been up to me, who God knows where those books would have been. You know, he he's preserved a lot of my history, and and, and I'm really thankful to him because of that. Big up the legendary Dash. You already know. My my people's so, right there. Say that again. Oh no, that that picture right there. That's my my people's right there. That's in Citrus Grove, the early days. That's uh me. Well, uh, you go changed ahead, the. Can you go, go back to the picture? Yep, yep. Yeah. So that's me right there to the, with the jury curls or whatever. My man Edgar, uh, my man Cool Rock. My man Carlos, who was a great, great, great up rocker, one of the dopest up rockers that I had ever seen um, up to that time. And then my homegirl, Barbie La Virotia, the twisted one, the easily one of the freshest female poppers of, of her time, fresher than most guys that I knew. Word. And, and you know, Chilski, something else you bring to the table is you are the ultimate b-boy from the dress to the style the talk how why is fashion also so important to you and like well as we see your styles develop in your characters you look just like your characters and, and the people <laughs> we see that you hang with you draw them you know why is that so important to you to maintain that tradition um man uh it was something what how can i explain it like prior to hip-hop I was a kid that was into, you know, in Cuba, I was into American music, believe it or not. We were listening to the shortwave radios and, and getting to uh, uh, the whole American stuff. So when I came to the States, um, I was into rock. I was into whatever pop was uh, famous and uh, even into some rap songs. But when it came down to hip hop, man, it, it just, it, it became me. And uh, looking up to a lot of these guys that were around at that time, you know, like Cool C, like uh, Mr. Flex, like Oz Rock. You know what I'm saying? All those fresh dudes that, that were around that time and, and seeing their style. This predates this predates um, Beach Street. This predates all of that. And I saw how those dudes, like, they were like, like they were like the ghetto superstars for real. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I I noticed very quickly at that time, you know what I'm saying? Not only not only with the guys that I saw here in, in Miami, but, you know, like going in, in those trips to New York, I saw all this element of, of, of kids, how they used to get color coordinated. And I just wanted to be like that, man. You know what I'm saying? So when I saw Cool C's characters, and then when I saw Doze's characters, like I wanted to become those characters. So, you know, even though, you know, my mom and my pops didn't have that much money, specifically my mom. She she really took care of, of, of my, me and my little brother. You know, we would try to make ourselves look as fresh as possible with whatever little we could afford. You know what I'm saying? Like, even at the, at the, at the very beginning, I'm, you know, like, I'm not ashamed of saying it. Like, my first my first B-boy shoes weren't, weren't no Pumas, weren't no Adidas. They were my Kung Fu kicks. You know what I'm saying? Those were my original Kung Fu sneakers. And even before that, it was a pair of bubble shoes called MA100s that I disguised with some fat laces and I made them look good and put some acrylic on it and made a match with whatever outfit I was using. You know what I mean? Word. And yeah. as far as like even the the gear, you know, I, I rocked some leaves, but, you know, be, prior to the leaves, I used to go to Zares, you know, whoever written, remembers Zares or Saida, yeah. Um, we used to go to Zares and it was like a, like a Kmart or a Walmart of the day. And, uh, just go over there, go to the, the, the little area where they sell, um, the, whatchamacallit, the, the jogging pants. And, uh, you know, to me, the jogging pants were like Kung Fu, Kung Fu pants, you know what I'm saying? So I, I used to get them and, and get dressed like that, put the spikes on, whatever, and then, you know, put the Kung Fu slippers in and just, just disguise the style. And uh, little by little, you know, I started, you know, changing up like with, with the times and the months because, you know, that that time is it, it, crazy how you start thinking of, and when you start analyzing, it was such a small period of time, but so much happened during that time because me, going from elementary to Citrus Grove, my junior high, mm -hmm. um, 
when I went to junior high, it was seventh grade year. It was 83 to 84. And I saw the, uh, like the Miami City Breakers, my boy Jackie, also known as Chili. I was Chili Willie and he was Chili. And looking at these guys and the way that they was dressing, man, I just wanted to be like those dudes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, slowly but surely, by the time that the following school year came by eighth grade, I had that style down pat towards science. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now I was rocking my leaves and my pumas. And we added like little flavors to it, like the, sp uh, the, the spikes on the on the little uh, holes for the, for the laces and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it was a, you know... Uh, it's slow, but not not that slow a progression. You know what I'm saying? And, and how did now you also got in, heavily involved in Zulu Nation and you were throwing the first jams, you know, Zulu Nation jams here in Miami at Power Studios, amongst other places. How did that help transition out of the 80s hip hop style that we know into now what's going on in the 90s? And what role did you play in that? Right. Well, well, the Zulu, we 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 need to understand something, and specifically for for Miami heads. Mm -hmm. Miami had a Zulu nation out here in the early days in 1984. It was brought out here by Jesse Jess and TK. Um, I was too young to join that chapter at that time, but it was always my dream to join that because if you know hip hop then you know Zulu Nation is hip-hop, you know what I'm saying? So I always wanted to be down. So around 1990, I want to say early 1993, like what was it that the hurricane Andrew happened? I 92, think it was August of 92. Right. So a little bit after that, I was working for a security company, and we had they had the, um, the contract with Allstate Insurance, and I just happened to be uh, at their headquarters doing security, not really doing the security. I was actually drawing because it was chill. So anywhere that I go, I draw. So I actually, one of those days that I happen to be in that, in that company, I'm chilling and I'm drawing and this brother comes in and introduces himself as mentor. And he's like, yo, have you heard about Zulu Nation? I was like, yeah, of course I've heard about Zulu Nation. So he's like, yo, we're starting a chapter out here, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, if you down, yo, hit me up. Um, that stayed in my mind, but I never really reached out to him. The funny thing is that next thing you know, my brother, same star, and another homeboy I was East, known to everybody as Jose Parla, um, had what? heard of some way somehow had got connected with, with Zulu. And and, uh, and just to it, point out, Ease also did the letters on this flyer, correct? Yeah, that, that flyer is Ease and, and myself. Uh, that's hip hop. Like that's the first jam that 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 our chapter did. Um, which actually, I wanna you know the chapter was the main sponsor of this, but this was Speedy Legs and Same Stars idea. Okay. okay, but um yeah, so come to find out that this chapter had been brought down here by Omar Islam, and you know you had you had Omar, you had the Rhythm Rocker, you had another brother named Soul and Mentor. They were there like the original four, and another brother named Beasley. Beasley also was a part of it. Um, and uh, they reached out to me. I met Omar. Omar came to my job with Team, and as soon as 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 soon as I heard this brother uh, talk, I mean. I was, I was, I was sold. I, I, I like all. I, I caught a flashback on my childhood, and I'm like, yeah, I want to be a part of this. You know what I'm saying? And uh, hence, I, I joined up, and uh, both Steam and I became actually the first two manifested members of the Miami chapter of Zulu Nation. The other ones were around, but they weren't manifested members. Um, we were the first ones, uh, and and Steam actually became vice president at the time. And later on, you know, later on, I, I rose the ranks myself. So you, 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 you got you. You always known the history of Zulu Nation involved in, and you see it as a child, and it now as a young man, as an adult, growing in hip hop, getting your art on, it continues to inspire you. And and what is the power that you see of the unification of people coming together under the branch of hip hop? Well, because hip hop is the only culture that I can tell you right now. I mean, that that has united all all peoples of all races of all classes. You know what I'm saying? Um, it, it happened in the Mecca. It happened in New York, and then as it traveled, you know, 
it, 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 we all became one under on on the, that flag of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? No matter, no matter if you was white, if you was black, if you were brown, if you were yellow, or whatever you want to call it, you were green. You could be an alien and you could be, be down with hip hop. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we didn't care about uh, politics and uh, and uh, all that, all the bull, bull BS that comes around. You know what I'm saying? We wa we wanted to be down with something that was us. It was a youth culture of that time, and uh, you know it didn't matter. You know we were b boys, b girls. You know what I'm saying? Graffiti writers, DJs, and MCs, and and specific specifically those from my time. You weren't just one thing. You 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 dwelled in all the elements. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, um, right. no doubt. My the little B, the my, my little brother. Had, who, every b boy had a rhyme or a marker in the pocket to catch a tag. For sure, for sure. The little cut they had their own little cut or their special mix. Although they weren't DJs, they knew how to do for sure. And we're definitely lacking that nowadays. Yeah, unfortunately, because it has become an uh, uh, an industry that is all about money and 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 they've turned this into like a rap thing. And this ain't about rap. This is about, it's a like youth culture. And those of us that, you know, our elders should, you know, strive to teach the, our, our youth on uh, how this was for real. You know what I'm saying? Yo, big shout out. First, things first, uh, before I go on, um, Brim, I want to give a big shout out to some of my people that I've seen. I haven't seen everybody, but Dude. I noticed that my man Need is on here. I noticed my my sister for life, uh, Lady Juice, is on here. Uh, who else I saw? Marley, my brother, my brother, my little brother, my man Junior Rock, and Felix. You know, all 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 my heads that are here. Thank you so much, guys, for sure, for joining because this means the world to me. Word. And and speaking of Marley, for example, he's someone that you were a big influence on. How did that go down? Because you look. That's my little style. brother, man. Uh, yeah. When Marley was in Citrus Elementary, I was in Citrus Junior. So a lot of the stuff that he said in his interview was very true. I wish that I would have had him right here, but I recently moved. But a lot of the stuff, uh, the the cardboard papers that he was talking about that I used to come out uh, after school rolled up, I still have those papers to this day. And you know, there will be uh, me uh, my my early pieces and some of my Bruce Lee portraits and um, you know all the stuff that I used to that I used to draw at that time but a lot of it was graffiti and uh Marley was one of those young young little guns that that was like amped and ready to ready to rock at the at the drop of a dime not only, not only was he a great graffiti writer he was a dope b-boy too you know what I'm saying and and you know him cheeks you know all those guys that later became became DFC you know what I'm saying they were part of of that that generation right there they were a little bit younger than me but they were they were in that circle, you know what I'm saying? Duo, you know, my man Charlie, who I love to, to death, you know, all, all those guys, you know? And, and it's interesting, because you mentioned earlier, you could even be an alien and be down with hip hop. Why do you think aliens became such like a, an important part of early graffiti? Like people were doing alien graffiti characters and here, you know, here's even your take on that. Why? <laughs> you know well, I mean, I, I, I would say that you know, obviously, Von Baudet had a, a, a great influence uh, with his characters and uh, Rob Botsky and, you know, people that were doing those types of drawings. You know, um, in the early days, like, like I'm, and, and mind you, I don't mean this as no insult. I just want to, uh, I'm speaking my truth. You know what I'm saying? Really? Uh, like, when it comes down to me, as far as art and as far as like characters and stuff like that, first things first, B-boy characters as they're known, as we know them, as as the mugs. Kusi was my original, my original father. Those, as soon as I saw, a couple of months after I saw Kusi, I saw, I, I, we, we used to skip, and there was a record store across the street from the Stitchers Elementary, and right there, going through the through the vinyls, I saw the Up Rock album. Up Rock uh, twelve inch, and I fell in love with 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 those and those characters. And uh, and he, by all means, he's the king, he's the father. But outside of that, outside of the hip hop element, a lot of people looked at the, the Bombo days. I love Bombo Day, but personally, I was a fan of Ross, Ralph Bosky before that. Um, when I saw the movie Wizards, um, when I saw Fritz the Cat and Coonskin, and uh, and before that, of course, I'm a Saturday cartoon freak so anything Hannibal Barbera 
anything Tom and Jerry, anything Felix the Cat or Woody Woodpecker or anything like that, that was me. And uh, what I did was that the characters that I that I initially learned from Kusi and and um and those. I kind of try to blend them with the Looney Tune characters in a sense. My flow was more like Looney Tune. So, you know, that was a, a huge, huge, huge inspiration to me. And, uh, but to get back to the question, as far as aliens, I don't know. We, we hip hop is are on some astronomical type stuff. You know what I mean? That's cool Keith, you know what I'm saying? Word. And I, I feel like as, and it was terms of pointing it out, the alien vibe was definitely when you think of jam on it and the voices that we yeah, do. For sure. For sure. What kind of Exactly. Planet Rock. Listen, listen, Planet Rock. Why did I love Planet Rock so much? Planet Rock to me is the epitome of hip hop. And, uh, what you want to call it? When I heard that song, it, it made me who I am today. And but I think that part of the reason why I love that song so much is because in Cuba I was a fan of a band called the uh, Bonnie M, right? There was like this yeah. German slash Bahamian disco band, yeah. and they had I, I loved them in Cuba. They were like my favorite. But they had a specific co uh, song called "Night Flight to Venus," and that song was like this whole like. I don't know, like, it's, it's, it was spacey, it was bugged out, you know what I mean? And then when I come to the States and my cousin introduces me to not only Star Wars, but also to Star Trek and Doctor Who, then I became like the space fanatic, you know what I'm saying? So when Planet Rock comes along, you know, space music, baby, you know what I'm saying? Space music that made me want to do things that I didn't know that I could do before because I had two left feet prior to hip hop, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. No doubt. And yo, for those of you that are just joining us right now, we got the almighty Chilski in the place to be, TNSB crew, VO5, I mean, the list goes on, FC. Um, and you have been crazy supporting us with these badges. We are really grateful, man. It's, it's a blessing to be able to continue to tell this story, especially with such a legend like Chilski, man. And so we're just going to keep it going. Um, so, man, how has graffiti in your eyes changed over the years? Oh, man. Damn, it's changed a lot. But can I get to this picture real quick right here? Yeah, yeah, whatever you want. Go ahead. Well, those are my brothers right there. To the far right, that's my man Zeke. In the middle is my man Trix and then me. That's the the early TNSB crew right there. The original three members. Um, These two guys came in a stolen brown Cadillac. It was in 1985, I want to say or late 84, that they came to my house to pick me up to go to the B club, but I was punished because I had gotten bad grades and I couldn't go out. But then at that time, they had also started the TNSB crew and uh, and they recruited me into it, the Nonstop Bombers. That's the first time that I joined like an official, official crew. Like before that, I had Mellow Boys and then before that, I had the Ultimate Crew, but <laughs> this was like the top guns right there. You know what I mean? My man Trix, also known as Tron, he was my my boy. Like, I met this dude. I, I want to say Trix came from either Jersey or Queens, but I, I, you will have to ask him. I can't remember right now for sure. But the first day that he it came and he started in my school, it happened to have been a Friday, and we had an after-school dance, and, you know, ultrasound DJs was rocking. Zeke was right there on the cut. Everybody was jamming. And here comes Trix looking like Lee from B Street. And jamming and, and popping and of course I had to freaking challenge him and we battled and after we battled we became inseparable friends and from there we started doing our little getaways we used to go to first period and then after first period we used to skip school and catch the 11 bus catch bad tags on the 11 and then go throughout downtown or if now we would go westbound and towards like uh um Midway Mall, known as one of the Americas right now, and cash tags there and at Castle Park and stuff like that. Yeah. So him, along with my man Buff and, and Red and Dizzy D and stuff like that, those are like the, my original first partners besides my cousin. And it's and so you touched on two things I want I want to learn more about. You touched on the Beat Club and you touched on Castle Park. Can you just kind of briefly describe how important roles those played in the development of hip hop culture in Miami? an incredible 
influence. I mean, if if you want to talk about them, but before we go even to them, we got to mention Allegro's at the Omni, which I couldn't get in because I was too young. But that was a, a spot right there where, you know, you had hip hop was was going on in there. As a matter of fact, one of the first B-Boy contests it was held at Allegro's, which I believe the Miami City Breakers won. Um, then you had Radio Powerhouse. Radio mm -hmm. Powerhouse was basically uh, an arcade that, slash little club that um the New York heads, uh, we used to call them the New York heads. Uh, I think that they ended up calling themselves, um, oh my God, I can't remember the name right now. Magnificent. Oh, uh, I can't remember the name right now. So, excuse me. Um, but <laughs> Skate, Cool C, Easy Is, um, who else? Who else? I believe that uh, Junski, Everlasting Force, the Everlasting Force. Those dudes are the guys that set it off at, at Video Powerhouse. And Video Powerhouse was an incredible spot. Um, it was really New York-style hip-hop. You know what I'm saying? Like, most of the New York heads that were actually out here in Miami was hanging at, the, at, at, at Video Powerhouse. And that was on 27th Avenue and Crow Way. And uh, soon after that, then Castle Park became another uh, another one of the dope places to go to. Um, it was e easy access for me because I could just catch the 11 bus and go over there if I didn't have a ride. Um, and then the ultimate spot was the B Club, which was on 40, uh, on Bird Road and uh, 90, either 98th or 99th Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, uh, Ave, I'm sorry. And uh, that was the, that was, that was like our Roxy because, um, I mean, you name it. In, in at the beat club, you had Friday nights, which was hip hop night, and then you had what we called GQ night on Saturday nights, which is you know more high energy, early versions of what we ended up calling freestyle or whatever. And you name it, they were there. Like Run DMC performed at the beat. Um, I believe Ben Twanis performed at the beat. Roxanne Chante performed at the beat. Um, Shannon, Lisa Lisa, um, Madonna. Madonna performed at the beat, bro. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, and it was a teen club. It was for us teens. I don't even know if teen clubs ever even exist, which was something that was real beautiful for us at the time because, you know, there were those that, that could get there because they had it like that and their parents didn't get mad. But there was those of us that the parents were a little bit stricter, like myself. And um, I had to do either little escapes or get my sister as a chaperone and um have her drop me off or uh, even her just chilling on the cut. You know what I'm saying? I, she wasn't too happy about that because my sister's much older than me. But, um, <laughs> you know, we had to do what you had to do. Word. But, um, yeah, it was it was a beautiful thing because at least we, we as kids had a nice little getaway. You know what I mean? And besides those clubs, then you had, of course, all the house parties of the time and um the park jams, Grapeland Park, Alimari Park. Um, uh, Clemente Park. I mean, you you had all these places that um that that do like little jams, and you know it, it was a great escape for us youth. You know what I'm saying? No doubt, no doubt. Yeah, man, there's a lot of hip hop history. Um, you're actually getting a lot of love for this wall. Some people are asking if you could just talk a little bit about this. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear this wall right here. People, you know, you're getting a lot of love about it. They're asking, can you just share a little bit about this wall? How'd you get the concept? Who oh, that's the rock. That's that's our rock and roll wall, bro. Um, we did that in in 2011. That was FC. It was actually supposed to be uh, uh made up uh, uh, like a little fake battle between um FBA versus TC5, but you know it didn't go as planned. So this is the TC5 side, TC5 FC side. And uh, we just wanted to do like a rock stars type thing, you know what I mean? Like I'm a, besides being a a, a, a diehard hip hopper, I'm a freaking diehard heavy metal head myself. So I always wanted to do like some some heavy metal characters and uh, throw it back to like Iron Maiden and uh, Black Sabbath and stuff like that. So hence that wall, you know what I mean? Word, 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 word. That's the kung fu wall, our first kung fu wall. And so I know also you did mention Bruce Lee earlier. We'll get we'll definitely get into some of that work. How has Bruce Lee been, you know, an influence in you and in your style over the years? 
without insult to my father, that's my father. You know what I'm saying? Like the father to to everything Chilski. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, uh, as a little kid, uh, I grew I grew up loving this dude. I mean, for, for, when I was in Cuba, I didn't know nothing about Bruce Lee. I knew about Satoichi and Toshiro Mifuni and you know all the samurai movies or whatever. So I was already a martial arts fanatic at that time. But when I came to the States, the first time that I ever saw a Bruce Lee movie was at Trianon Theater. And um, I saw The Big Boss and Chinese Connection as a double feature. And uh, it blew my mind. And then afterwards, I saw a movie called Bruce Lee, The Man, The Myth by Bruce Lai, Hong Chong Tao. And uh, that's when I learned that Bruce Lee had passed away in 1973. And it kind of like broke my heart, but then I, it made me a fiend to like research this guy. And uh, and I just wanted to do everything that that that, that he did. So, you know, uh, at, at an early age, uh, I started, you know, practicing, you know, uh, you know, a little bit of JKD, a little bit of Kung Fu and stuff like that. Besides boxing, which was my mother art, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, but a Bruce was a huge influence. And, you know, anybody who's anybody knows that, you know, not only Bruce Lee, but Kung Fu movies in general are a huge part of this hip hop culture. You know what I'm saying? We, mm -hmm. the, the whole challenging, the whole battling thing, the whole Muggsy thing comes directly from Bruce and from Kung Fu movies, you know? The move the moves you know a lot of a lot of the moves were super influential to to us you know i mean all you got to do is look at mad monkey kung fu by 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 the shaw brothers and you you're going to learn a lot you're going to see a lot of, of that now you know the five deadly venoms uh, uh you know uh, master vengeance uh, the spearman of death all of that you know all of that becomes together with 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 with, with um with us, with, with us young hip hoppers of that time. Word. Yo, for those of you that are just checking in, we got the almighty Chilski. Let up. The response has been crazy. The chat is crazy. We appreciate all the support, the badges, the love, man. Keep keep it coming in, man. We are grateful to be able to spend time with a legend right here, man. True, true, mm -hmm. true OG. Um, so you have you've had a lot of partners. You talked about Dash a lot. Who are some of the other people you paint with regularly? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, can I hear you? Oh, I said you have had a lot of partners over the years that you've painted with a lot. Who are some of the people you paint with regularly? Um, my cousin Dash is my first and foremost uh, partner. And then uh, I would say my man Fume, my man Zane, who's my freaking white brother from another, um, uh, Cero, my, my, my Delhi Venom brother and also FC brother, you know, um, Guys like that, uh, my man Seam. I haven't written too much with Seam, but like just recently, a dream came true that I finally painted with Seam. You know what I'm saying? That's my brother since since like '86. But um, those are like the main guys that that I usually paint with. Um, you know, and other uh, my man Seam also. Um, who else? Drums. You know, those are some of the fellas that I that I usually write the most with. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, <laughs> and 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 so your your style with your characters, right? Did anyone ever mentor you in this? Did you just kind of pick it up and carry the tradition? How did that happen? Well, unfortunately, nobody actually taught me directly how to do them. I I feel that that if if that would have happened, I would have been a much better uh, writer or or, or or cartoonist. Um, the same as with, with dancing, like I never had a, a real official teacher. I, I learned from what I was seeing. Um, so, you know, wait, Chilski, I think we lost your audio. Check, check one, two. Can you hear me? Chilski, can you hear me? I can't, can y'all, people in the chat, let us know if you can hear Chilski or hear me. Chilski, can you hear me? Hello, hello? Yeah, I hear you. I hear, we lost you for a oh. minute. We lost you for a oh, minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for some reason I hear you like really low, like like somebody called and uh, and I lost you right there. Can you talk to see if I can hear you? Yeah, yeah, we hear. I think we're all good. We're good. You, okay. We, we all, Okay. Can y'all hear Chilski now? 
Oh yeah. So like I was, so like I was saying, um, unfortunately, like I never really had a, an official teacher per se. Um, I, I was lucky that you know I, I was uh, already drawing since I was a little kid. So you know I was able to pick up those skills like pretty, pretty quick. But you know, um, I had to take a bite out of crime to be very honest with you, in order to get to where later, later on, you know what I mean? What, I had to copy and then, you know, not, not completely take a, take a bite per se, but like look at the work and then try to develop something out of what I'm looking at. You know what I'm saying? Like, like not completely do a doze character because I knew, I knew that that wasn't right. You know what I'm saying? Like I knew that if I do a, a those character, or, or say on a paper or on a wall, you know what I'm saying, it's not gonna be correct. But I could use elements of that character and try to develop my own style, you know. So that's how I kind of like developed it. And you know, seeing, seeing again, you know, seeing Cool C and seeing and seeing those as characters, like I knew that there was a different level that I that I that I needed to rise above. You know what I'm saying? That I, I needed. I needed to um, not not compete because I would never challenge my masters because they're they're they're, they're, they're my elders and 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 I have the the utmost respect for them. But I, I, I challenged myself into becoming better. You know what I'm saying? And then whatever the other competition was, yes, I was going to try to be better than them at that time. You know, but uh, still be honest of where my influences came from. No doubt, no doubt. And and I mean, even you, you can, the thing is like your work can transition from wall to canvas to clothes to, you know, most people I feel like can't make that transition as well as you do. What do you think the key to that is? Um, it's funny you ask because I never imagined myself drawing on anything other than at first I, uh, on, on paper, obviously, and then, and then on walls. Um, I want to say, I want to give credit, first of all, because my boy, Mendez, also known as Besa, he actually kind of like threw me a canvas one day. I want to say it was in either in the late 90s or the early 2000s. And he threw me a canvas and he's like, yo, here, boom, do me a canvas. And it was the first canvas that I ever, ever, ever did, like, officially. Like, I had tried to do stuff before, but I, I'm kind of like ADD. And, and and if I lose concentration, I won't get back to it until God knows when. Mm -hmm. So Mendes actually kind of pushed me into doing, like, my very first, um, my very first canvas. And uh, then slowly but surely, I started picking up. And, you know, through trial and error, I, I made a lot of mistakes. I didn't know how to how to mix a lot of pain and all this because even though I went to art class, I flunked it badly, you know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. in art class, in junior high and, and in high school, I wasn't paying attention to what my teachers told me. I, I just wanted to draw what I wanted to draw. I didn't want to draw an apple. I didn't want to draw a, 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 a vase. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do none of that because I felt that it was, you know, it wasn't a challenge to me. I wish that I did though. Because it would have taught me so much. It would have mm. taught me about shading. It would have taught me about, you know, different, the lighting and stuff like that. But, you know, as a kid, you're not thinking that way. So, unfortunately, mm. I didn't. And I've had to learn a lot of this stuff later in life, you know. Mm. But, yeah. um, you know, thankfully, you know, some of the stuff is looking okay now. Thank God, you know what I mean? Like, oh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm glad that people like it, you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's I, I, I still... I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, I am my own worst critic. Like sometimes I cringe when I see some of my stuff, mm -hmm. but you know, as long as people like it, hey, I guess uh, I'm doing something right. Word. And and so we go from the incredible breakers, right, into the Miami City breakers. Tell us about the importance of this photo, and then we're gonna get into like you and Deadly Venoms in that. Oh, these dudes are 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 my dudes. Um, the kid that you see in the middle, the dark skin kid, that's Jackie. That's uh, also known as Chili. That kid right there, he 
was is an important part of my life because first of all, when I started in Citrus Grove, again, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm coming into the big leagues right now. So I was in seventh grade and Jackie, I believe was already either in eighth or in ninth grade. So at the time, I was a I was a beginner in both popping and in and, and in and graffiti. Um, he was already a part of this crew, a, a crew that was already well known in Miami. So already heads have seen me with a shirt that says Chili. He's got a hat that says Chili. So then people started trying to start trouble between us. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, and right. um, to to his credit. Jackie never treated me bad. Jackie was so super cool to me. Um, actually, to even to a certain extent, I was kind of like a little brother figure to him at the time. And it helped that, you know, my homegirl, my heart also, Lady Juice, you know, she she was down with him. I, I, as a matter of fact, I, I want to say that they might even be related, but I got to ask her for, for sure. Um, um, but Lady Juice, who actually is the, the person who taught me how to tag, you know, she kind of like had me under her wing too. And, uh, you know, the, the, by having certain affiliations, I was able to get cool with some of these guys. So if you go back to that picture again, if you don't mind. So to the to the far right is Rubio. Then comes Pee Wee, Jackie, my man, my brother, E.T. Pop. That's the, the, the dude that I used to look up to as a popper. Him and Reversal, like the number one and number two. Reversal is like my ultimate hero. Uh, E.T. is the, the 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 second dopest popper ever in Miami. Then that's uh that's Noel, uh, Pinocchio, and no, let me see. No, that, no, no, I'm sorry. That's uh, that's Mario, Pinocchio, and Noel at the end. So those guys, there's two uh, two, uh, two missing members right there that are my homeboys for life. Little Louis and Crazy Ricky. Two of the baddest that ever did that out here in Miami. So, you know, that to me, that crew right there, specifically early 83, 84, those were like my heroes because, you know, um, they're like my elders. You know what I'm saying? My elders. And, and, and they was doing stuff before I did, you know? So they were like, and, and they were not only that, but they were from my area, Little Havana and La Pata. You know what I mean? So those are my dudes. Then, you know, then, of course, you know, I mean, you know, cast like, you know, the Street Masters with Reversal and Kid Freeze and, you know, Swipe, right? May he rest in peace and Gizmo rest in peace and all these other dudes. And they were on on, on a different level themselves. And, you know, of course, my man Speedy with, with Frosty Ice and Chino, you know, those are dudes that then I started looking up to uh, later on when I made my little travels like towards, um, you know, uh, to like the beat and, and and to Castle Park and stuff like that. Word. So I mean, and so tell us, Deadly Venoms. How did it transition? You so now you're in the '90s, 2000s as a as a pop and crew, electro funk. What do what do y'all what do you represent, and what is the philosophy behind your dance crew? Well, the Deadly Venoms is a crew that uh, myself, Cero, and my man Cuba created um, during the resurgence of the dance. Um, there was really nobody with the exception of two or three popping. Uh, I'm sorry, th that, that picture right there, that guy that you see right there with me, that one, that's Jackie right there, the same guy that I'm talking to you about, Chili. Chili, okay. From Miami City Breakers. That's when we re reconnected again. Um, but yeah, so as far as the Venoms, um, we, we were a bunch of poppers that you know, didn't see nobody else popping and, and we were fiending and we wanted to, to, to bring popping back. And at the same time, we were fiending the battle. So, you know, when Speedy was having uh, practices on, you know, 10th Street and Ocean Drive, you know, I, me, I would do my Zulu meetings out there and, uh, and then come back to the practices and chill right there with them. And after a while, I started kind of getting bored because nobody was battling, you know, everybody was, practicing on their freezes and this and this and that, but I didn't see no battling. So I started looking for trouble and I started creating little teams and I started telling Speedy, yo, pick a team, pick your members and I'm going to pick my members. And of course, you know, I picked my, my poppers into my team and a couple of uh, uh, B-boys like my, my, my man, Little Fiend and, and stuff like that. And, and then we would battle right there in the, in the beach. So then the next thing you know, um, we, noticed that it was getting serious 
you know, it, it was becoming more than just a little having fun type thing. And uh, then we decided that we wanted to create an actual crew. So, you know, we threw, on, we threw in some names. Of course, I threw in all the Kung Fu names. I threw in, you know, Three Evil Masters, uh, Five Avengers, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, the Deli Venoms. It was originally Five Deli Venoms because we had Kid Blur and Warlock also down with us. But um, I've always felt that the name kind of would limit us. So I, we left it as Deli Venoms. And then throughout the years, you know, we became a, a much larger crew, you know, and came, you know, Gato, and then we recruited E.T. Pop, and uh, my, 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 my homegirl, Shmoo, and uh, finally Reversal. And then, of course, you know, pr even prior to Reversal, then we started creating a younger crew called the Venom's Mom, which we brought in first uh, Robo Rick and, and his partner, Ill Kid. And uh, then they, we recruited Atari and Frank, aka Havoc, and and the One, and then the Glyphix. So you know, our crew has grown throughout the years, and um, you know, we still, you know, it, it, it's cool because even though we ain't we ain't as active as before, it, to us is like our own family. You know what I'm saying? Like this is guys that I could actually have to, in my house and and chill. They, they could have a drink. I'll drink some water. You know what I mean? Because I don't drink alcohol. Uh, but, you know, I could chill with these dudes anytime, and it's and it's lovely. You know what I mean? The same like right. with, with, with my brothers from the graffiti and, and, my, and my underground cypher brothers, you know? That's, that's like family to me. Well, so you met, you brought it. What is underground cypher? Underground cypher is a crew that got started in 1992 by my brothers, um, uh, Q, D DJ Dela, Raw J, um, my man, um, Stilo, I forget who the other members, but they were cool that um they were doing it already in the early nineties and uh they became affiliated with Zulu. A lot of those dudes became Shaka Zulus with me, uh, part of the security force of Zulu. So we always had that bond. I mean we were soldiers, but at the same time we were MCs. And uh in the mid to late nineties, I had this idea that I wanted to create an, a, a, a raw crew. This is actually even, around the same time that the Wu-Tang was coming out, I had an idea, which is the original Delhi Venoms. The original Delhi Venoms wasn't even a popping crew. It was an MC crew. And it was the best for my crew, which was heavy artillery. I was going to get my man, um, uh, 501 Code Red, into the crew. And then I was recruiting members from Underground Cypher into our crew along with Reset. And uh, so we were going to be the original Deadly Venoms. We actually had a little demo that we made with, with DJ TMS. I don't know if TMS remembers that, but we went all the way to Homestead and uh, we recorded uh, two songs. One is a solo by me and another one by the Deadly Venoms, the original ones. And uh, and then in the last couple of years, we reunited again and um, we uh, actually dropped two albums and we're working on our third one right now. Word up, man. So, I mean, you, again, the Renaissance man, the almighty Chilski and the place to be. <laughs> I hope y'all are enjoying this so far. We still got some more stuff to cover. We're going to jump into some of your sketches and Blackfoot work, man. Thank you for just jumping, being willing to jump around and share your history with us, the stories, you know, the knowledge, man. We appreciate it. We're going to keep it going right here. Um, so with drawing and pencil sketching, how is that different to you than what you do with your canvas work, your black book work, your wall work? Portraits is my, 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 my love, my first love. Um, I started as a little kid, like I told you before, my, according to my grandparents, even since I was like four years old. Uh, so when I was a little kid in, in Cuba, I was drawing, um, I used to love animals, specifically the li lions and horses. I loved them. So I, was, I would draw them. And then when I got into samurai movies, I started drawing like, you know, like the little samurais or whatever. But then when Bruce Lee comes along, I was drawing everything Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee. So I was, you know, practicing my portraits uh, with Bruce and Dragon Lee, one of the Bruce Lee imitators. I was drawing him too. And um, before you know it, then I'm like, you know, hey, you know, I, I started getting pretty decent at it. And then I started drawing, uh, you know, I started drawing like a lot of rappers, like around 86 on I mean, the time that the shirt king started coming out you know with all those funky shirts with audio 2 and just ice and all that mm -hmm. you know i started kind of like going like that that same route and i started drawing a lot of um rap artists and r&b artists and, and stuff like that and and rock artists too 
Um, I wish I would have sent you some of those pictures, but I got them in um in uh, storage. Oh, but uh, yeah, so it, it, I I loved doing portraits. It's something that is very is gratifying when when I'm able to do it pretty decent, pretty alike because I can't. One thing that I cannot do, I can't trace, man. I hate when people trace. I hate, you know, you know, I, I hate shortcuts, which, you know, I'm I'm starting to learn that sometimes you need to do shortcuts in order to accomplish certain things. But to me, I, I, I just love looking at a magazine, even if it's a blurry picture, and try to recreate that image on paper so um you know it was it was it was really fun for me to draw all those those uh those portraits specifically at, at that time now nowadays i do it a, li a little bit different where i do the uh, i i get a picture on on my phone and i kind of like try to enlarge it and look at you know enlarge the eye and kind of like look at the eye and take it from there and then try to measure the nose from the eye and stuff like that you know kind of little funny tricks or whatever, but still, you know, still staying true to me, not tracing, you know? And, and, and I feel like with that comes along, you really capture, you know, you capture what was going on culturally, stylistically. I mean, if you look closely, you'll see on some of these, someone with Adidas or with some kangaroos or like just the, the cultural references and the fashion references are crazy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm kind of stuck in a in a time capsule, man. Like, <laughs> I I I got a I got the brain of an elephant when it comes down specifically to that era. So I kind of I live through my drawings, and and I try to remember like what style was at what particular time, like and and so so specifically with my with my b-boy characters one one of the things that i that i always wanted to do was keep it authentic to what whatever year i'm trying to portray you know what i'm saying so like for example if i'm if i'm doing a character from that 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 looks like he came out in 1983 or 84 I don't want to put him with gear that came out later on in 86 or 87 like for you example like, you, you mean like big, some cats you mean some cats like this is what you're talking about Exactly. So those cats right there would be more like 80, like early 80s, 80, 82, 83, 80, not even 84, 80, 83, the latest. You know what right, I'm saying? Got you got know, the dude's got the afro, sure. the other homeboys got the big hair, you know? So, you know, like I would, on, on characters like that, I would never put a chunky rope chain because you know that the chunky rope chains didn't come onto like later. Like even in 86, you had chunky rope chains, but they weren't the exaggerated, you know what I'm saying, slick Rick, run DMC type of chunkiness, you know what I'm saying? Right. They were a little bit more, you know, they were a little bit thinner, you know what I mean? And and us that were B-boys at the time, you know, we used to rock the, the, the nice little thin rope chains, whether they were gold or silver, it didn't matter, you know what I mean? But they had a particular look. So I try to keep it as authentic as I possibly can, you know what I mean? So usually I kind of like, you know, I sit and I kind of like close my eyes and I remember that time and I try to remember what I was wearing uh, in my junior high and what, you know, like the fellas that I used to hang around with used to wear and the ladies, what they used to rock, you know what I'm saying? And try to keep it, you know, as 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 precise as possible, you know? Because right. one, one thing that I don't want to do is kind of like make a mockery of of my era. You know, sometimes people they 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 try to front like they was there, and then they'll do something that is like you know I'm like I'm like wait a minute that that style didn't come until like later you know what I'm saying yeah so I'm, I'm I'm a little bit picky when it comes down to that it's just me but you know <laughs> what can I tell you no but that that's part of being you know you are a real archivist and you really know the fashion and the culture and that's that's one of your jobs is to keep teaching the people this is what it really looked like at this particular time I mean like homegirl on the left a hot 105 shirt you know what I'm saying yes yes that's I had so to <laughs> Miami, you know what I'm saying like you, yeah. you again you just big ups big props for for 
you know, really capturing, people are mentioning it in the chat. It's like a, a frozen time capsule. And you really are that, man. You bring us that fashion. You bring us right into that time zone. You know, so I really want to thank you for that work. Thank you, bro. We, we, you. Are, we are running a little bit over time. Do you have a little bit more time to rock with me? Because I want to... I got how much time you want, brother. Okay. Bet I got that nothing up. to do. <laughs> bet that up. So you, is this work, the stuff in your black books, are you selling canvases? What, what are you doing beyond just sharing um, it with us? I currently started kind of like share, uh, you know, selling some of my stuff. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a businessman, bro. So I don't know how to price myself. So sometimes I, I've sold some canvases and my cousin wants to kill me because he's like, how, how are you going to sell that for so cheap? But it's like, dude, I'm not, I'm not a superstar, bro. I'm not, I'm no, I'm, I'm nobody to demand, you know, like these guys that that are real legends demand. I'm I'm nowhere near that. So you know, I'm just happy that you know I could sell some of the stuff. You know, and people are willing to pay a little bit of money for it, and and I'm happy because it helps me with my bills. <laughs> God knows that I need that help, but um, you know, uh, it, it's something that I'm kind of new to. You know, uh, with the canvas stuff and. Um, and the merchandise, I, I started a little line called Deaf City Goons, uh, okay. doing some little T-shirts and um, and, and and a pin. Um, I, I mean, I'm gonna I'm working on, on my second pin right now. Okay. Um, and, and but, I, mean, uh, I mean, just 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 to point this out to the people, homegirls, you got a Jordache outfit, you got a Frankie says relax, you got an IOU with a Tour de France hat. I mean, again, the, your cultural references and people are saying you selling yourself short. I mean, you. The, regardless, we thank you for opening up your your art to us and sharing it with us. But yeah, man, because of the cultural relevancy, I feel like you could definitely be selling your work for a lot more. And we that's something that you add through as you keep doing, you know, work with us through, you know, you're on Art Talk, you're networking, you know, all the right people. Everyone loves your work and respects your work. You definitely have a big. Uh, if you want to, you have. a big opportunities ahead of you if you choose them you know what i'm saying i would love it I'm, I'm 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 about to retire from work so i would love to make a living out of this i mean but you know again you know i i, I i'll be real bro and and i know that i'm gonna sound like an idiot when i say this statement and please forgive me but you know me i just love to draw and i don't really care so much about the money you know what i'm saying sometimes that that money corrupts your, your, your train of thought so to me it's just more fun just to flow with it and if i could make a dollar too that's fine but you know it's it's something that you know that i'm not you know uh i'm not really like oh i, I need to 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 make so much money you saying selling my stuff i mean if it happens it happens god willing you know what i'm saying only only god could shed that on me and and, and if it happens I'm gonna be more than grateful, but other than that, man, I'm still, I'm still gonna rock no matter what, man, until until the day I die, man. we and he, exactly, and here's here's the Deaf City Goons pin you're talking about. <laughs> we got some t-shirts yeah. we have available, right? No yes, doubt. yes. So I mean, yeah, you your work is definitely legendary, and I'm sure everyone out here would support if you made it available to them as well. You're getting a lot of love in the chat, and thank y'all for tuning in. Um, just thank have you a guys few more so much. minutes. This right here, though, I mean, I just, my wife and I just watched it the other night. Pharaoh, tell us what's <laughs> popping. What am I looking at? What is this? Man, you're looking at the movie Vandal. Um, this is, this was such a fun project. Um, I'm going to try to give you the short version of the story, but uh, I was blessed. I got a great friend named Angie Martinez, who happened to be one of Pitbull's uh, um, lawyer, or was Pitbull's lawyer, excuse me. And she reached out to me one day a couple of years ago, and she told me, hey, Chili, um, there's some guys that are planning on filming uh, a movie or a series, and they, they're interested in, in, you know, in, in contacting people that know about graffiti, whatever, whatever. And uh, I, I dropped their name in it, and um, I'm like, thank you. So I, I went, and I met up with these two individuals, JD and his partner, and um, and and and. I was in the house and we talked and uh, originally it was supposed to be a series. It was supposed to be a series that they were going to pitch to, um, I think it was to Prime, Amazon Prime or and Hulu. Um, 
uh, I gave them, you know, so I told them some of my stories and stuff like that. They they were hyped. They kind of wanted to write a, uh, a part for me, but I'm like, yo, I've never acted in my life. So, you know, we talked, we talked. Um, I had that first meeting with them and uh, I didn't really hear from them for a while. And then I think it was uh, about two years afterwards, they reached out to me again and they're like, yo, Chili, we're not doing the series no more. We're, we're actually shooting a movie. Um, we, and we want you to be a part of it. I was like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll come in and I'll be an advisor. I know, no problem. And they're like, no, 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 not as an advisor. You've got a part in it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so, you know, they actually wrote a part for me and uh, I was bugging because, you know, I've never acted before. So they were like, yo, don't, don't worry about it. It's going to be cool. You know, just be yourself, this and that. And uh, I submitted some work for, for the movie. Um, I actually painted uh, one of the walls. And uh, the day that I shot my scene, man, it was, I was nervous as hell. But thankfully, one of my old pals from uh, high school, Ozzy, um, he he was actually one of the main cameramans or the main cameraman that was filming me. So he put me at ease and I was able to get through the scene and <laughs> and, and yeah, that's my first acting gig, yeah. uh, which was a whole lot of fun. And it's a, it's a very, very good movie. It was yeah, actually it, really, really good. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of it. And uh, hopefully you guys watch it and, and enjoy it too, you know. Uh, yeah, and there, there's definitely, a lot. Definitely cool, cool flick. Chilski too, there's a lot of Miami legend, legends in it. Um, if you watch the I, credits, it's crazy. You just, there's you no know it. You know it, my man. June, Smash, all these dudes will be submitted work in there and, 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 and they rock, man, you know. Yeah, man. And so we're, we're kind of coming to the end of the interview. This is the end of uh, your 2021 run. Tell us about this piece. What are we looking at? Oh, that's Gangsta Boogie. That's Gangsta Boogie. That's my, my, my me and my brothers, uh, Fume, Zane, and Cero, and myself. And with a lot of support from my big brother, Elborn. Um, This is a piece that we've been wanting to do for a couple of years, actually. And... Uh, for whatever reason, we hadn't gotten around to do it, you know, but it was always like a dream that we had that we wanted to do something that didn't have that many colors. We wanted to do it tops for colors. So hence, you see the white, the black, uh, the white, the black, the red, and uh, gray. And we wanted to do it like it looked like an old school gangster movie and stuff like that. And... Uh, it, it came the opportunity to rock this um on this R Basil and um and we went for it and thankfully it came it, it came out pretty decent. I'm kind of proud of that of of how it came out. No, it's really really fly, man. And before we get out of here, thank I you. Mean, you were thank also you, commissioned. No, no, give thanks. You were also commissioned by the Museum of Graffiti to do this new installation. Yes. Uh, so I'd love for you to tell it, talk to us about this, and y'all have to head down to the museum and see this because this is such an amazing, beautiful piece and beautiful vibe. So tell oh, us what man, it is. Yes, exactly this is at. this is actually a dream come true almost project. Um, number one, I was able to rock with my brother, my VO5 brother, Sam, who I'm claiming VO5, but just so everybody know, I was VO5 for only a little bit because <laughs> James kicked me out. Year Jay Ski, <laughs> nah, but um, what you gonna call it? Uh, I always wanted to paint with Seam, and he contacted me and he told me that Cat had this idea. So, you know, the idea was uh, for me to rock some b boy characters, some mugs out of but uh, basically do characters that of real people that were both writers and b-boys originally we were going to do a tribute to those and we we're going to do the the up rock album characters which would have been fly but then we changed you know they wanted to do only kenny and those and then he wanted to do fable and uh, wiggles and frosty so i was like you know what if i'm if i'm going to do that then i'm going to re I, I cannot do those as characters because that's going to be me biting his character so i'm going to recreate those as a b-boy who's easy he's he's one of my top i mean not only is he an inspiration but he's one of the guys that I, when i do big hair dudes in my characters is those and my and my cousin dash because they're like twins almost you know what i mean um 
Candy, of course, and then I had to re- uh, create uh, Wiggles, Frosty, and and um and Fable. So as I'm doing these characters, then I'm saying, damn, for 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 the other side of the wall, what should we do? You know. And hence, I was like, I told Sim, yo, we should do a Miami scene. You know what I'm saying? And that's how we rocked. So, you know, we put, we did like a little connection between New York and Miami and influences that, that, that we had out here. So the first character is the legendary Ozrock, who's not only an incredible b-boy, but he was also a graffiti writer. My man Speedy Legs, who everybody knows as, you know, the mayor of Hialeah, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Miami's ultimate b-boy. Um, he also used to tag, um, in the middle is scene, of course, who also b-boy that he's a, an incredible up rocker. Then my homegirl, my, 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 my freaking partner, Lady Juice, Cammy, and then I drew myself. Uh, the, the one in between Speedy and scene is Asia One from the West Coast, um, who's a b-girl and a writer too, um, you know, uh, can't really want females in there, so, so I, we couldn't really think of who else to th- throw. So even though she ain't from Miami, she's down by law with us. So we was like, yo, you know what? I'm I'm gonna rock Asia, and I did Asia too. But um, originally, I really wanted to draw Mr. Flex. You know what I'm saying? I really wanted to draw Flex on that wall. But you know, hopefully in the near future, I got something planned that you know that will lead us to that. But yeah, man, it was a great wall that I that that I had the opportunity to draw with scene. And uh, seem rock the eye of the tiger, man. I mean, like, it's the eye of the tiger by Bill Blass. I mean, yo, he seemed rocked it, and and what he did with the background too. You know, he 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 murdered that wall. You know what I mean? And yeah. I just enhanced it with with the characters. Yo, I mean, Chilski, this is a legendary interview with a legendary brother. You know, we got nothing but love for you over here, man. We actually, we are very happy to be owners and supporters of your work. We got, we got a few Chilski pieces. We got the pin. We want the shirts. Anytime it's available, let us know. I'm sure the people in this, you know, in the chat, let them know because you got a lot of people that just want to support you because of your, you're a genuine brother. You show love and you are, you are hip hop culture. No one could take Thank that away. Thank you, my brother. I really appreciate it, man. Give thanks. Um, yo, so if there's any last questions y'all want to drop in the chat, thank you everyone for your support. Art Talks, Miami Art Talks usually are Thursdays. My name is Brimstone. We just had a little bit of a rescheduling. I hope everybody out there stays safe, stays healthy, stays fresh and fly. And if you ever feel depressed, yo, open up a Chilski piece. If you like, man, I don't know who I'm going to go on a date with tonight. Look, man, look through Chilski's black book because he got some females in there that are ready <laughs> and available for purchase. You know what I'm saying? Much love, Chilski, man. Thank you so much for being the brother you are, man. We love you, homie. Uh, thank you, my brother. Um, I just want to, you don't mind, I would like to give some shout outs, man, before Absolutely. we go. Um, I want to give a shout out to my man, Amos, from Miami Best Graffiti Gra- uh, Guide, who is one of those guys that has got me out there to paint also and has given me a lot of jobs, and, and I thank him with all my heart. Um, I want to thank, obviously, my children, my Chino, my China, uh, my man Reverso, my man E.T. Pop, my brother Sep, my cousin Dash, Zame, Cero, Fume, Airborne, um, Lady Juice, my man Trix, Zeke, and, uh, you know, oh, man, I'm for- I know I'm forgetting so many people, man, but Oh, Marley, Mar- <laughs> my man Marley, um, Clue, KV, Cinna, you know, all you guys, man. I love all you guys, and uh, and and thank you guys so much for the support, and thank you for tuning in, and, um, you know, what else can I say? I love all you guys, and whoever I might have forgotten, you know, you, you know, I'm, I'm going, going blank right here because I'm a little bit nervous, <laughs> but... <laughs> You know what, I think let to get out on a high note, if you will, and you could rock something for us, you could drop a little rhyme. A little, a little rhyme? rhyme. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, what should I kick? All right, I'm going to kick some Miami stuff. Yeah. 
I'm going way, way back to the days of video. Powerhouse, the beat club, Castle Park Studio. 183, Randolph's, 1235, Manhattan's, Illusions. 1v05, was running things, rocking walls and vamping niggas. Latin Kings, aka LD Killers, TD4, TNSB, BBC, MCB, Street Masters, TDK, Mellow Boys, MCC, BB Love. This is the actual story. Before Luke, Amos Lockers, and Pretty Tony, DJ Nice and Nasty, MC Mighty Rock. Flex and Oz, Rock, Reversal, and E.T. Pop. TKK representing. Oh, man, I can't remember. Yo, <laughs> that's it, y'all. It's official. It's going down. Art Talk, Museum of Graffiti, Chilski, the one and only Secret 007. Peace. My brother, peace. <laughs> <laughs>